Buongiorno, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, la salute goes uh, very well. I really hope that uh, I will soon be uh, with you. So basically, I am very pleased to be here and to talk about esketamine, uh, uh, talking about uh, our clinical practice in using esketamine here in Italy. We have been the national coordinating center for esketamine trials, and then we have continued using esketamine afterwards. We also have uh, a larger hospital where we use uh, intravenous uh, cathamine. We used to uh, prescribe intravenous cathamine before esketamine was uh, uh, allowed. These uh, are my potential conflicts of interest. So esketamine is approved here in Italy, as I believe is approved in your countries uh, for treatment resistant depression. We know that treatment resistant depression is highly prevalent uh, up to 50-55% of patients will not respond to the first line antidepressant treatment despite adequate adherence, dose, and duration. We know that between 60 and 70% of our patients fail to achieve a complete remission. Up to 20% of patients... Up to 20 Do you hear me? I'm sorry, do you hear me well? Up to 20% of patients have not recovered two years later. 10% of our patients remain depressed despite multiple interventions. So how do we treat uh, uh, resistant uh, depression? We may change antidepressant, we may add an antidepressant, uh, we may add lithium, we may add an antipsychotic, or now we can add esketamine. This is uh, the newest option uh, in uh, our country. So let's quickly review what happens when we add an antipsychotic or when we add esketamine to the treatment. Adding an antipsychotic empowers the antidepressant effect of the antidepressant that we're using. We know that antagonism at 5-HT2A receptor, agonism at 5-HT1A receptor, antagonism at alpha-2 receptor, partial agonism at D2 or D3 receptors may contribute to antidepressant activity, in some cases also may confer additional anti-anxiety property to the medication that we're using. There are trials about adding aripiprazole on top of an antidepressant showing efficacy for major depressive disorder. There are also trials about adding kefiapine on top of an antidepressant, again, showing efficacy for major depressive disorder. Of course, the episodes of depression that respond to aripiprazole are not the same episodes of depression that respond to ketiapine, but this is a good option. How does it compare to esketamine? If you look at these meta-analysis systematic review, looking at the effect sides of adding an antipsychotic versus the effect sides of adding esketamine. You see that with esketamine, you have twice as much the effect sides that you have with augmentation with second generation antipsychotic. So esketamine is a very powerful intervention for treatment resistant depression. What we know, this is the trial to which uh, we contributed, we participated, is that if you have a patient with treatment resistant depression, you put that patient on esketamine on top of an antidepressant, you have approximately three out of four patients that will achieve remission. See, in this trial, 76.5% of patients achieved a response and 58.2% of patients achieved remission. So actually response happens in three out of four. And with response, we mean improvement by at least 50%. With remission, we mean basically all symptoms going away. But having three patients out of four, they get better. Three patients out of four that improve by at least 50% is definitely a huge effect. It's very important to point out that esketamine has been designed 
as a medication for treatment resistant depression. The ideal patients for esketamine are those patients that have not responded to two, three, four antidepressants. We may try esketamine even for refractory patients, meaning those patients that don't respond to anything. But those patients are very difficult. So if you're planning on using esketamine, according to my experience, the sooner you use it, the better, because esketamine is extremely good in preventing a treatment resistant episode to become treatment refractory. Because when you have a patient with refractory depression, probably that patient should go to electroconvulsive treatment. But esketamine comes before electroconvulsive treatment. Esketamine is very good to avoid that a resistant episode of depression become refractory. So here you see patients started with pretty severe depression with a score in Montgomery Asberg depression rating scale greater than 30. Very quickly in four weeks, it went down and then patients continued feeling better throughout the, the long-term maintenance treatment. Sketamine is approved for patients that have failed at least two antidepressants and so they are experiencing an episode of resistant depression. How do we administer esketamine? It's very easy. That's why I was saying that we are switching from administering intravenous ketamine because intravenous ketamine requires the anesthesiologist, requires cardiac monitoring, requires respiratory monitoring, very often requires oxygen supplementation. Esketamine is much easier. Esketamine just requires a room, a chair, or a bed and somebody to watch the patient for one hour, one hour and a half. It's very e easy and very safe. It's administered twice a week, two days in a week for the first one month for four weeks, then once a week for the following four weeks, and then once a week or once every other week afterwards. So it's twice a week for a month, once a week for another month, and then either once a week or once every other week. For those of you that have not prescribed it yet, it comes in these dispensers, in these devices. Each device contains 28 milligrams. It's assumed intranasally. And every time you push the plunger, you get 14 milligrams of esketamine. People that are older than 65 start with one device that is 28 milligrams. People that are younger start with two devices that is 56 milligrams. If they don't respond to this dose, it may be increased up to three devices, again, twice a week in the first period of treatment, that adds up to 84 milligrams. These are some practical guidelines that I participated in. The first author is Professor Kasper from Austria, and along with other colleagues of uh, uh, Poland, uh, uh, Spain, and again, Austria and the United Kingdom, we wrote this practical recommendation based on our experience with using esketamine in a clinical practice. How do we administer it practically? Patients should not eat two hours before getting esketamine, should not drink 30 minutes before getting esketamine, should not receive any nasal anticongestant or decongestant one hour before. Contraindications are being allergic, hypersensitive, or aneurysmal vascular disease, a history of intracerebral hemorrhage, or a recent, meaning in the six weeks before the administration cardiovascular event, such as a myocardial infarction. So there are not many contraindications, but given that a very small percentage of patients may experience hypertension, we don't want to give esketamine to people that may be at risk if they experience hypertension, for instance, people with an aneurysm. I was saying that we need monitoring for esketamine because if patients experience side effects, that happens in the one hour, one hour and a half after receiving esketamine, and then they no longer have side effects. So this is a medication different from the other because if they experience side effects, it's just for a short period of time. How do we administer it again? 
patients should not eat for two hours, should not drink for 30 minutes. They arrive to our clinic. We measure blood pressure because patients with hypertension do not have a contraindication, but first need to be treated for their hypertension and then can be treated with esketamine. So if blood pressure is normal, we administer esketamine and then we monitor patients for about one hour, one hour and a half, and then they're able to leave. But monitoring me means watching them. We have a nurse usually watching patients and then they can leave. It's not like the monitoring that we need with intravenous caffeine. Side effects may include somnolence, drowsiness, it's an anesthetic, may include dissociation, may include, again, dizziness. That's why patients should stay in a comfortable chair or should stay in a bath. These side effects usually are mild or moderate and disappear within one hour, one hour and a half. In clinical trials, we had only 3.8% of patients that discontinued the medication because of side effects. The uh, pharmacokinetic of esketamine signals that it has a short half-life, it's biphasic, but it quickly goes down the, uh, the level. And the biggest peak is at 40 minutes. So after 40 minutes from the administration is when, if there are side effects, we see the majority of them. Here, for instance, you can see the increase in blood pressure or dissociation. As you can see, when patients experience it, it gradually increases, reaches a peak at 40 minutes, and then goes down. Same thing for dissociation. So basically, hypertension, as I was mentioning, is not very frequent. Only three to 4% of patients experience hypertension, meaning that 96, 97% of patients do not have hypertension. And even these three, 4% of patients usually don't need any intervention. In the majority of cases, you just watch them. You may see the blood pressure increases by 10, 15 millimeter of mercury. But in our center, it has never happened that we needed to intervene. If necessary, we can give a diuretic, but it has never happened. Dissociation is very common. Depending on the trial, there have been different uh, frequency of dissociation, but it is not a psychotic dissociation. It's not like patients are getting agitated. They're not getting psychotic. Dissociation is depersonalization, meaning they feel detached from themselves or derealization. They feel detached from the world. For some patients, it's unpleasant. For some patients, it's neutral. For some patients, it's even pleasant, but it doesn't last more than one hour, one hour and a half. Again, it reaches a peak at 40 minutes and then gradually fades. It's very rare that somebody asks to stop esketamine because of dissociation. Be careful with combined treatment. We have had many patients, not in the trials, because in the trials we couldn't use medications in combination other than an antidepressant, but in clinical practice we have combined esketamine with lithium, with ketiapine, with other antidepressants, and we haven't really seen any major problem but be careful when you combine it with highly sedating medication because it's an anesthetic or with medications that may increase blood pressure because esketamine itself in three, 4% of patients may temporarily increase blood pressure. After one hour and a half from the administration, which again is very easy, patients put the device into one nostril, close the other nostril, push the first time and uh, uh, inhale 14 milligrams, then put the device in the other nostril, push the second time and they inhale the other 14 milligrams. Then they wait five minutes. If they need the second device, they repeat the same thing. If they need the, a third device, they wait another five minutes and then they repeat the same thing. It's very easy. Patients learn immediately. So after 40 minutes, we check blood pressure again. After another 40 minutes, the patient is ready to leave. We check that there is no longer dissociation, that there is no sedation, the blood pressure is normal, and then patients are able to leave. They should not drive until the following day, but they can go with public transportation. 
Here, very, very quickly, I wanted to share with you the experience with one of the guys that has had a great benefit with esketamine, young guy that came to us after a resistant episode that had lasted for about one year and a half, 18 months. He was feeling depressed, blunted with loss of interest, lack of concentration, tiredness. He had stopped going to the university and he was pretty depressed. He had already failed citalopram. He had already failed venlafaxine. He was presently on 30 milligrams of paroxetine and couldn't tolerate higher doses augmented with aripiprazole and he was still very, very depressed. So what did we do? We switched from paroxetine to sertraline by cutting paroxetine by 10 milligrams every three days and stopping immediately aripiprazole. We started sertraline at 50 milligrams and then gradually titrated it up to 100 milligrams. We started the sketamine at two devices, 56 milligrams, since this is a, a guy 26 year old. So we start with 56 milligrams. He improved from the second administration. We have had patients improving from the first administration. It doesn't mean that they recover, but they get better. You see immediately that they're changing in many cases. From the second administration, his parents were already telling us that he was looking much better. And so he continued to improve very quickly. And by week four, he was completely into remission went back to school, met a new partner, and we decided to discontinue esketamine after one year of treatment. He's still in our clinic, he's still on sertraline monotherapy, and he's doing very well. So we know that esketamine is a strong treatment for resistant depression on top of an SSRI, SNRI. We know that patients respond, respond very quickly, once they have responded, they should continue the medication for at least six months. And then depending on how they're doing, we may discontinue esketamine. Esketamine is good for treatment resistant depression, may help for refractory depression, but the sooner you use it, the better. Depression is heterogeneous. It's not like esketamine will treat all episodes of resistant depression, but it's definitely a huge change in terms of our armamentarium for the treatment of resistant depression. It has changed a lot in the life of our patients and in the life of our clinics. So it's definitely a good add to our pharmacological armamentarium for the treatment of depression. Thank you very much for your attention.